Hello friends, in this video we will have a discussion on the editorials and opinion articles which came on the second week of the January in the area of science and technology. Editorial 1, the much neglected pollutant which came on January 9th. Now, this editorial actually brings into focus three important points. One, a global rise of ozone and in particular the northern hemisphere of our country. One, and second important point that it raises is the necessity to put in place pollutant specific data, in this case ozone. So ozone specific data and policy measures which are required to circumvent this problem. And third, the importance of maintaining forests. So these were the three important outcomes. Let's get into this editorial. So as I said earlier, this editorial brings into focus the threats from ozone pollution in India overall, but particularly in the North India, which affects our northern capital region. We all know that it is not surprising, it is not unusual to see smog filled uh, dawn in our national capital region. While the recent measures taken by the government and also civil society such as national air quality index, national air quality monitoring program, graded action plan that are in place in the recent times, these all contributed to a overall increase about the awareness of the pollution. But despite this growing awareness, still there are some areas where we are lacking. While this awareness is about the overall rate of pollution in the country, pollution specific knowledge, data and measures are in fact required. As this article is about ozone in particular, let's see more about this. So what is the name of this report? This is a report which is impact of regional climate change and future, future emission scenarios on surface ozone and particulate matter 2.5 over India which was published in the year 2016. According to this study which was a simulation study conducted for a 10 year period beginning from 2026 to 2050. It is a simulation study for a 10 year period beginning from 2025 to 2050. In the simulation study, the researchers have found it out that the surface ozone is predicted to rise in an alarming level in the northern India. Let's see a few points about the ozone. Ozone is an allotrope of oxygen with the molecular formula of O3. It is also a strong oxidizing agent and ozone in, in nature, it can be found in the stratospheric layer which is responsible for filtering out the harmful UV rays from reaching out the earth. And that is why stratospheric layer, stratospheric ozone is also called as a good ozone. But due to anthropogenic emissions, the ozone can also form at the surface level, which is called as trophospheric ozone. So ozone can be found in the stratospheric layer as well as as a trophospheric layer. But the trophospheric layer ozone is called as a bad ozone and considered as a polluted. But how this uh, ground level ozone forms? In the presence of oxides of nitrogen and interaction with volatile organic compounds and hydrocarbons in the presence of sunlight, it results in the breakdown of molecules of oxides of nitrogen which results in the formation of ozone. So this is an event which is completely different than how ozone in the stratosphere forms. So the formation of ozone in the stratosphere is different and the formation of ozone in the trophosphere is different. It is purely due to pollution. So this trophospheric ozone is anthropogenic in nature and it is also considered as a secondary pollutant. Now the article also added more points, it has predicted that there will be a rise in the ozone level. 
But what would be the reasons? What would be the contributing reasons for this ozone level rise? One, the growth of industries responsible for the emission of these pollutants, such as coal powered fire plant, uh, coal fired power plants, brick kilns, and other sources of fossil fuel emissions, and an increasing number of vehicles which resulted in vehicular emissions, which also contributes to NOx. So these are the twin reasons for the alarming rise of the ozone level. In addition to this emissions, the article also points out there are certain climatic factors which complicates this issue further. There are two, impo there are two important reasons which aggravates the pollution problem in the national capital region. The one, it is due to temperature inversion in which the cold air is trapped to the ground level during winter times. This cold air which is trapped at the ground level results in very reduced circulation of the air and hence the pollutants at the surface is completely stagnant. The stagnation of the pollution, pollutants causes the rise in the pollution level. So the first two reason it is due to uh, temperature inversion and second reason development of anticyclonic circulation in the northern hemisphere. The anticyclonic circulation in the northern hemisphere also reduces the movement of air. This reduced movement of air current results once again in the trapping of the pollutants. So in addition to the growth of industries, increasing number of vehicles, there are also climatic factors which contributes to the rising pollution or in particular rising ozone level in the northern hemisphere. So according to this research report, what is the prediction? By 2020, there will be an increase of about 4.4 percentage or in absolute terms, 2 parts per billion in terms of ozone levels in large parts of North India particularly above Uttar Pradesh. Even though the picture is very dark, it is not so. While this is the case in above the North India, the Southern India or in the Northeast India where there is a considerable forest cover, there is actually a decrease in the ozone level. So while there is more forest patches found, they are found to be a decrease in the ozone level while on the northern India there is an increase in the ozone level. It is this finding contributes or adds the importance of maintaining forests, maintaining forest cover. So the research article also adds up that climate change also will complicate the issues further because it affects soil moisture, climate change will affect soil moisture, rain or vegetation density which in turn affects the absorption of ozone. I want to add one more point here, vegetation, plants are also responsible, they are capable of absorbing ozone. So when the vegetation density decreases, obviously that results in reduced absorption of ozone. Now how can we link the future predictions about the ozone level rise with the policy failure? So with the growing number of vehicles, with the growing number of machineries and the power plants, as we said earlier, by 2020, there will be 4.4 percentage increase in the ozone level. So there will be, as there is a growth of industries, there will be a ozone increase by about 45 percentage. 4.4 percentage above North India. But if we fail to put in place sufficient policy measures, required policy measures, the rise will be 45 percentage, not 4.4, but 45 percentage. Now this brings into focus the importance of necessary policy measures. What are the necessary policy measures? What we discussed earlier, that we need to put in place suitable pollution specific collection of data. Pollution specific collection of data and pollution specific intervention measures. These need to be put in place. And this increase in ozone will be more or less uniform throughout the country except where there are green patches. So vegetation has a crucial role to play in reducing the increase of ozone level in the country. Now what are the impacts of this ozone level rise? The impact of ozone is on both flora and the fauna. 
The main reason why ozone causes damaging effects because of its oxidizing nature. It causes oxidative photo oxidative damages to plant which results in its reduced photosynthetic ability and in animals it has twin effect of affecting our respiratory system and also reducing our immune capabilities. So in animals particularly humans it affects the respiratory system and the immune capabilities but in plants it affects photo oxidative capacities. And how the article concluded? So the surface ozone, the trophosphoric ozone not only damages health but it also destroys the crops. It reduces its photosynthetic capacity and it is in this context in a country where agriculture is still an important source of livelihood and food security. In the second editorial which came on January 10th, it was an editorial about the road kill of wildlife on our national highways. Now this editorial brings a classical debate, a debate between conservation and development. So the developmental pursuit should not at any way jeopardize the wildlife conservation or the forest conservation. But why this issue arose? This issue came into the focus because of a recent death of a prime time tiger called uh, named as Bajira in the Boar Reserve of Maharashtra, not due to hunting or not due to natural death, but due to roadkill on National Highway 7. It is due to this roadkill that it raised a debate on how to realign or how to modify the existing roads along the national uh, reserve, national park sanctuaries or biosphere reserves. Why is it so? Why this death is very tragic? Because of three reasons. That, that the construction of unsuitable roads inside wildlife habitats occurred even though the wildlife reserves in turn is protected. So this death is not due to, as I said earlier, this death is not due to hunting. It is not due to natural causes, but rather indeed due to an accident which can be avoided. So this avoidance nature of this accidents makes it very tragic. And the death occurs at the peak productivity age of the tiger inside its own habitat. The second reason why it is tragic. And third, despite the direct monitoring of tiger conservation programs by the prime ministers. So despite the high political favors enjoyed by the tiger conservation programs, roadkill continues. It is the three reasons makes it very tragic. Now this roadkill, which is just an example of a major uh, problem, is just one example. So this roadkill brings into focus the contradiction between the policies the policies of development and the policies of wildlife conservation. And this picture, the two picture, this is a global for forest watch, it interpolates on the spatial map on the extent of forest cover in terms of the density of the forest cover is represented by the green color. And this, the second picture, it represents the road network of India more like a veins and capillaries. Now we interpolate this, the first picture with the second picture. Now we can understand how much that road trespasses or how, in, how deeply that road passes through this uh, wild cover, to, through this forest cover. So it is this what is referred as a contradiction. So this highlights a contradiction in development policy and the wildlife management. It is not to be saying it, it is not amount to be saying that roads are to be completely prohibited inside the reserves. It is not the policy recommendation. But any scientific advice reduce the impact of roads on the wildlife corridors. It should be properly uh, heeded and only heeding to the scientific advice will result in preventing the jeopardizing the conservation efforts. So this contradiction, how to deal with the contradiction? to prevent the roadkill. To prevent the roadkill along the national highways, the one easy solution is to stopping this road construction further. But this looks very simple but it is not so. 
because taking such a measure will at in turn harm our developmental programs. So the sensible response would be to stop any further road construction in the wildlife habitat, reassessing the impact and on the existing roads it needs to be realigned or it needs to be modified based on scientific output so that the wildlife need not be further affected. And is it a very serious measure to be taken? Of course not. Why is it? Because the protected areas constitutes just 4 percentage of our country. So prohibiting or stopping road construction within just 4 percentage of, a, of our geographical landmass may not be an extreme step. It is also a rational step even recommended by the article 14 of the convention on the biological diversity which speaks about impact assessment and reducing the adverse impacts that the effect of highways on the wildlife conservation need to be considered in the light of article 14 of convention on the biological diversity and the advice rendered by the national board for wildlife the apex organization for the wildlife conservation must be properly heard by the central and central government and the national highways authority of india so that the existing roads are realigned or modified sensitive to our conservation needs. So what is the road ahead? How are we going to deal with this roadkill issue? So an assessment by Wildlife Institute of India states that nearly 26 reserves it faces the destructive impact of roads and traffic. So such is the extent of the problem. So in the light of the severity of the problem, what would be the measures that can be taken? The series of measures includes modification, National Tiger Conservation Authority should insist on modification of existing roads, how to modify, to provide road crossings in the form of over bridges or under bridges, in the form of over bridges or under bridges at strategic locations to enable the movement of animals through the roads without getting hit. The second measure would be to realign the roads away from all such landscapes wherever possible. All such roads have to be completely avoided. And third, levying user charges. This collection of the user charge may also result in raising revenue and promoting sustainable tourism. Imposition of curbs on traffic passing through the sanctuaries even though this is a strategy already followed in many wildlife uh, sanctuaries and national parks this has to be very strictly enforced using speed restraints such as speed breakers and allowing escorted convoys when the traffic is under movement in addition to this during night times where animal movement is very highly observed that a ban on complete private movement of vehicles should be putting in should, should be placed to enable smoother movement of animals through these corridors without getting uh, under the wheels of the vehicles and religious tourism through these forested areas also should be strictly regulated. So these are the measures that we can take to reduce this impact of roadkill on the wildlife habitats. But we also need to know why do we need to enable the movement of animals through the roads. There are two reasons for this, why we need to enable. That the isolation of animals is not preferable in the light of the wildlife management because only when the animals are enabled to move, whether there are roads or whether there are rivers, only when the animals are enabled to move, it can disperse and it is the dispersal ability results in gene flow. If the animals are restricted along the roads and it results in generation of two different habitats which prevents the flow of genes. The prevention of the flow of genes results in reduced biological diversity. It is for this reason that we need to enable the movement of animals across the roads. There is scientific evidence also for this. On a well studied case in the Kangha Pench Corridor by Wildlife Institute of India, it was found out that a national highway in fact blocked the flow of genes between the two adjacent sites of the road. 
So this is what the impact of the roads on the flow of genes within the wildlife. So what would be the conclusion for this issue? The remedy, if not for the all the national highways in our country, at least the remedy for the national seven is a combination of realignment and creation of underpasses to enable the smoother movement of the animals and the sustainable way and even a long term solution is that the center should institute mechanisms considering the advices given by the Wildlife Institute of India, uh, National Board for Wildlife, N National Tiger Conservation Authority that whatever the recommendations provided by these expert organizations must be heard on suitable modifications could need to be institutionalized. And it is also an important part that realign, realign the roads is also consistent with the Wildlife Action Plan 2002-2016 as announced by the previous BJP government under Atal Bihari Vajpayee as a former Prime Minister. And without a determined effect and without a political will, the road kill will in fact severely diminish India's conservation achievements despite a growth in the forest cover. The editorial three that was published on January 11, 2018 titled A Pioneer in Biotechnology, Hargobin Kurana was born in 1922 in Raipur which is now a part of Pakistan. He did his schooling West Punjab and as had done his undergraduation and post graduation in Punjab University in Lahore. And in 1945, he got an opportunity for a Government of India fellowship. And using this opportunity, he went to England and pursued his PhD degree in the University of Liverpool. And he stayed there for nearly four years. After this brief period in 1949, he moved to Argobin Kurana moved to Cambridge University in 1950 until 1952 and after 1952 he moved to US as a research fellowship in the University of Wisconsin University of Wisconsin in the department of Institute for Enzyme Research from 1960 it is in 1960 that his phenomenal works and his contribution started flowering and since then he became a naturalized citizen of United States in the year 1962. And the works that he has started in this Institute for Enzyme Research for years has made a ph phenomenal contributions on understanding how the genetic code in DNA is translated into proteins. It is for his contribution along with Robert W. Hawley and Marshall W. Nirenberg that they were recognized for these contributions and rewarded and received 1968 Nobel Prize in Medicine and in the words of Nobel Prize Committee for the interpretation of genetic code and its function in protein synthesis. It is for this that they were awarded the Nobel Prize. So why his contribution is very important? What about the significance of his contribution? He has elucidated the genetic code by actually creating synthetic RNA versions. This put up a stepping stone for the present genetic engineering experiments which involves cutting and joining DNA fragments. So in fact, the experiments that he has done during 1960s is a stepping stone for the present day contemporary genetic engineering experiments. So he created the first synthetic genes. Not only that, even though the, the experiments he conducted were in the times of 1960s, it is still significant and relevant and has a very contemporary relevance in the most exciting realms of biology such as synthetic biology and gene editing. It came in the news because his contribution towards the biology was recognized and in his birth anniversary, 96th birth anniversary on January 9, Google Doodle put up his picture as, as a mark of his contribution. But why this discovery is important? His discovery of genetic code. In 1953, 
James Watson and Francis Crick revealed the structure of DNA, the double helical structure of DNA. Even though this discovery is very important in understanding how DNA is structured, it is still the first step. The step is incomplete. We need to know further how the DNA structure, how the structure of DNA is important and relevant in converting the structure of DNA into proteins. This was not known during the time. And this gap in its knowledge was filled by James Watson. It is James Watson who completely prepared this table of genetic code. What genetic code is? Genetic code is a set of three nucleotides in which each code for a particular amino acid. Genetic code is a set of three nucleotides, each coding for a particular nucleotide. It is only by understanding the genetic code, we understood how DNA provides information for making proteins, which in turn enhances our understanding of the cellular functioning. It is for this reason that its contribution is very important. In addition to that, which we said earlier, he also created artificial RNA molecules, synthetic RNA molecules. He created synthetic RNA molecules, which is now is an inspiration for genetic engineering. So what are his contributions? First, making the first synthetic genes, which is considered as a forerunner, a beginning point for a process called as polymerase chain reaction, which are right now used extensively in diagnostic and treatment procedures. So making the first synthetic gene as an inspiration for the present day polymerase chain reaction. Second, by the way that he created synthetic genes and used in bacterium and cloned it, he can also be regarded as the founding father of biotechnology. The current buzz in the biotechnology, which is CRISPR and Cas9 system, which are an important tool in the gene editing procedures, also cites the references of Argobin Kurana as a key influence. So these are the three key important contributions that he has made to the field of biology. And it is also fitting to, to, to remind the contributions that he made, Indian American citizen, and his valuable contributions to this science and technology. The topic is also important and also valuable to note down because in paper three syllabus, okay, in paper three syllabus, we have to prepare about contributions of Indians for the development of science and technology. So under this heading in paper three, that probably we need to have, we need to understand the contributions of Argobin Kurana, Indian American, to this field. The next editorial, Feeling Sad, Blame It on a Winter, was published on January 14th. And let's have some discussion on this editorial. In our life, we would have faced depression in one form or the other, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. It is about this new form of depression that was published in this edit, that was in, highlighted in, in this article, which, are, which is called as Seasonal Affective Disorder or SAD. The uniqueness or a, or, or a special feature about this SAD is that it is seasonal in its manifestation. So seasonal affective disorder is known to affect the larger population during winter and subsides away during summer. And that is the reason why it is called a seasonal affective disorder. In terms of symptoms, it is very classical and very often is similar to how a depression appears. So this article also brings into focus the psychological and metabolic impact of seasons, which we very often fail to uh, observe. The psychological and metabolic impact of seasons and temperatures on the humans. But only through this article, we have been exposed to various uh, 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 surprising facts about this uh, depression called as seasonal affective uh, disease. On an average, it affects people in the age group of 18 to 30 in general, but it can affect any person. Very often, 55% of people in the family 
have either one or multiple episodes of depression and in some cases 6% of people requires hospitalization and needs medical attention and very often this depression comes in the form of stigma or discrimination also and which particular year that the sad becomes prominent as we said earlier it is a phenomenon based on temperature and light when the temperature and the light reduces which we observe during the winter seasons sad predominates so sad symptoms is very often seen from december to february now we need to move on why this uh, uh, depression occurs depression occurs in climates usually where there is a less sunlight at certain times of the year which is winter but how this can be correlated i hope you are all aware of no nobel prize in medicine for the year 2017 was given to circadian rhythm which explains about the diurnal variation of temperature hormones and metabolism in all organisms there is a diurnal day night variation it is this diurnal variation called as circadian rhythm and it is due to, it is for the circadian rhythm that nobel prize 2017 was conferred but how circadian rhythm is regulated please understand the key uh, uh, fact hidden behind is diurnal variation what varies between day and night light so a key input which regulates circadian rhythm is light intensity so our body's temperature metabolism hormonal secretion varies according to the intensity of light it is the same which is reflected in um, uh, sad also so uh, seasonal affective uh, depression disorder is based on light intensity which in turn is linked to circadian rhythm so it is not wrong to say that sad occurs due to sudden alterations in the circadian rhythm which reflects in the secretion of hormones which in turn reflects in our um, uh, psychological behavior in, in our behavioral pat patterns so due to this sad the human body its metabolism and the hormonal secretions also gets affected which in turn leads to mood fluctuations and behavioral changes what are the symptoms of sad fatigueness very often during win winter times we are bedridden and 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 we try to look for cozy beds and warm beds but don't be mistaken or don't be taken away any uh, sudden sign of fatigue during winter times could be related to sad or bouts of depression which constantly rides you a feeling of hopelessness social withdrawal isolation social isolation and overeating so these are the classical symptoms of sad which particularly comes during winter season according to indian Med medical association sad is preferential over females than males it very often affects women than men and age of onset which i said earlier it affects most between 18 to 30 years but irrespective of any can come at can affect any person irrespective of age it is very wrong to say that sad is a lighter version of depression it is very wrong sad is in fact a depression the only different that it is a depression based on seasons so it is just a different version of the same illness same depression and to be considered as a subtype what are the preventive and treatment measures the enter symptoms of sad emerges due to changes in light intensity so and also a reduction in the physical activities if we put an an, an effort to to tackle both that uh, problems the sad also disappears so what are the preventive measures ensuring a healthy and a balanced diet well hydration take large intake of fluids getting enough sunlight and engaging regular outdoor physical exercises are all the important preventive measures that one need to take and in terms of treatment if if some person is seriously affected by sad the treatment in, includes enough light exposure if needed even artificial light exposure 
sun therapy and psychosomatic drugs also can be preferred. So now this article enlightens us that depression can be seasonal also which our dear ones may be facing or we ourselves also may face and we need to understand the impact of light on this and rather than getting restricted to our beds or to the corner of the room we have to come open expose ourselves and face the sad with hope. For more videos subscribe to our smart readers IAS online channel in the YouTube.